네, 미국 시카고 선물 거래소와 월가 현재 동향을 생생하게 전해드리는 월가 트레이더 버니의 미국 주식 시간입니다. 어, 오늘 같은 경우는 이 나스닥에 대해서 이야기를 좀 제대로 해주신다고 하는데 뉴욕 증시의 기술적인 분석에 대해서 들어볼까 합니다. 오늘만 하더라도 기술주 중심으로 나스닥이 좀 하락을 했기 때문에 더더욱 의미 깊은 시간이 될것 같은데요. 관련돼서 지수와 종목들 어떻게 움직였는지 설명 부탁드릴게요. In early January, we looked at the number of new highs, number of new lows, the advanced decline line, all that sort of thing, and we could see the erosion that was occurring. Okay, and we talked about that. We've talked about that a little bit since end of November all the way in. Well, let's just like get an update from there. Remember this chart I put out before, and what this chart does is this chart looks at basically the percent of stocks. That are above their 200-day moving average, and during the course of all of 2021 and the end of 2020, we were in this range between 72 and 90 percent of all of our stocks were above their 200-day moving average. Well, that's great. That is an indication the stock market's going up, but that's an also an indication of we don't have a lot of problems in the market with stocks that are breaking down. Now, what we also saw that in September we started to take that lower, and between September and the end of the year, the early part of January, we went between basically 50 and 70 percent. So we got up to that 70 percent level that we were at before, and we couldn't get any higher. The individual stocks within the indices were starting to break down. The, the indices, like the Nasdaq and the S&P, they're dominated by the five to seven biggest companies. So when you look at the stock market and you say the S&P 500 is here or the Nasdaq here, we overweight those big stocks so much, and we have to we have to recognize that we want to look inside the market, look at all the stocks together. So that's where we were at the end of December, beginning of January. Now let's take that going forward. Now that we've gotten deeper into our correction, and let's look at where we are right now. So here's that here's that same box we were in. Okay, through all of 2021 until the third quarter, here's where we got where we basically traded between 50 and 70 percent, and boo! Look at what happened in late January. We really took that down. We took it down to 25 percent of all the stocks. Only 25 percent were above their 200-day moving average, and you've got stocks like the energy sector because energy prices are going up, going up because of inflation, that are kind of skewing that. So if you pulled out energy, that percentage would be even lower. Now, these are indications of a market that's clearly oversold when you start to get this down, and you're identifying that you're firmly within a corrective phase. Okay, let's look at the next chart. We do the same thing, okay? And instead of looking at the NASDAQ, let's look at the S&P 500. Um, I, the NASDAQ has 2,500 stocks in it, the NASDAQ composite. And some of those stocks really, I don't want to say they don't deserve to be there, but they're too small. They don't make any money. They're not significant enough, relatively speaking. They're not a great judge of the overall economy. There's a downward bias to the bottom tier of those stocks. So when we look at the S&P and we see what happens, in COVID, this top clip is the number of stocks that are above the 200-day moving average, okay? And then in the bottom clip, it's the number of stocks that are above their 50-day moving average. So you can see that there's more volatility in the bottom. In COVID, we had a significant decline in the number of stocks that were above their 200-day uh, moving average was low. This dotted line right here represents 50% right here. Okay, and we stayed above 50% all the way through into September. And since then, we've been lower than that. And this is the same kind of thing where this is the, I'm sorry, this is the 70% level, and here's the 50%. So we start to break down. So we can see that the number of stocks, even in the S&P 500, is not conducive right today 
to continue stock market rally. And what we see is this is indicative right now of this corrective phase that we're in that we may be in for another couple of months. Let's look at the next chart. Now, briefly, I just look at this and I say, what happened when we were in uh, the stock market rally? The green bars are bars where the, the up volume, that's the cumulative up volume of stocks that closed higher on the day. The red bars are the cumulative down volume of the stocks that closed lower on the day. So do we have more up volume or more down volume? So you can see right here that, that the green bars were substantially higher than the red bars. It's just a anecdotal observation. And what we've seen now is we've seen a lot less cumulative volume on the upside and much more cumulative volume on the downside. I continue to look for this. And what we see when we see this is just a brief stock market rally. I'm looking for extended periods of more up volume than down volume. And I constantly look at that all the time to be able to identify when we're really turning out of it or when, or when we're just bouncing off of a bottom. Let's look at the next chart. So this is the NASDAQ composite. Again, looking at new highs, new lows. This chart we ran basically through today. And what we can see, this pink line down here, is the zero line. So if you're above the zero line, you have more new highs than new lows, a healthy market. And you can see that in November, we started to go below zero, so we made more new lows than new highs. And we had a big move down here, and now we're trying to get back above zero, but what's gonna happen to us is we're probably gonna get to zero, bounce, go down. Get to zero, bounce, and go down. We need to get back above zero and stay above zero for this market to have clearly turned. Now, this is one more chart that we looked at the beginning of January. Okay, and this is that new highs, new lows on a longer term basis. So this takes us back for the last five years. Okay, and we can see that in 2018, we had a 10% market decline and we got down to what I drew as a uh, red line down there, red horizontal line. COVID hit us much deeper and then into the early January, we had gotten back down to that same line that we hit at the end of 2018. Let's update that chart now to see where we stand currently. And what we can see is this 2018 line was right here. We went much deeper into that thing and we've touched that line, that panic line where the number of new highs were hardly any at the end of, uh, or at the, at the onset of COVID, and the number of new highs relative to new lows, many more, many more new lows. We got back to that same level. So we had the same amount of pessimism in terms of stocks making new lows that we had in the onset of COVID when we did not know how substantially, how substantial this, this uh, a virus is, uh, how more, uh, what the mortality rate was, whether we're all going to lose our jobs, um, all those things. And that's why the pessimism in that March of 2020 was so significant because it was a complete uncertainty for us. We did not know anything. And over time, we realized we can get through this and the, and the mortality rate um, if we stayed, in, so we stayed inside, we did all those things. We wore masks. The mortality rate basically slowed down, and we were able to combat the virus and to be able to work our way economically back to a stronger economy. So let's look at the next chart. Now, if we think about it, okay, new highs, new lows, okay, advanced decline line, all those, those are just flat out observations of prices relative to, of the, of, to the market as a whole. How many stocks are making new lows? How many stocks are making new highs? But we can also look at um, how optimistic are people. So we can look at sentiment. So when we look at sentiment, okay, and I drew this top line right here, the bottom line is the stock market. The top line basically is 70%, 50%, and 30%. So, 
This is how negative we were. We were so pessimistic down there. We couldn't believe the stock market could rally <coughs> because we didn't know where we were going to be as individuals. We popped out of there pretty substantially. And then what we did is we hauled the 50% level. The other thing is, is in an uptrend, and we're not necessarily in an uptrend now, we're in a corrective phase, but in an uptrend, whenever you get below 50% and get back above, those are great buy opportunities. And I identified those all across the board. So for a year and a half, we had probably, what is that, 13 or 14 of these buy opportunities. We've gotten down here. Okay, we bounced above it. <coughs> but I still think we're in a corrective phase because when you pull bullish sentiment out and you also look at new highs, new lows, what you really want to do is put everything together. Okay, so we need to have, and I don't want to say this in a negative way, but the more negative sentiment we have here without prices going down much further, the better the buy opportunity we're going to have going forward. So my belief is that we're probably going to chop around here in a pretty volatile range with a slight downward bias because I believe that we had market decline levels like in late January where basically everyone was short or sold out down there, substantial number of people. Because we could look at the, at the number of people that were short, we could look at the sentiment indices and say that's a good place for a bounce. We're gonna have a couple more of those as we go through the course of the next month or two, and then I think we're gonna start to roll back higher. So when we look at what happened, uh, say at the end of January, and we got down to here, but yet we bounced up there fairly significantly, we had a couple of things going. We had a tremendous amount of people selling the market, but we also had people that were identifying that there were good buy opportunities. Stocks were really good. So what we had was we had Netflix come out and that stock really got hurt after their earnings announcement. And Bill Ackerman, and I think we've talked about this before, who runs Pershing Square, which is a $13 billion hedge fund, spent a billion dollars worth, bought a billion dollars worth of stock at around $370, $380. And don't forget that stock was over $600 in the fourth quarter of last year. So his comments at the time was, these are really attractive prices for a stock that has a great market setup, okay? It's in a great business. And when we take this out three to five years, we're going to have great income coming out of that stock. And so he felt that he's not going to get better opportunities to buy that stock. So these are examples of being able to identify stocks that really get oversold, go down more than 50%, go down 60 70%, and you're able to buy them. Netflix has had a bunch of 50% declines over the course of their whole uh, life cycle since they've become uh, an IPO. Amazon, same thing. There's been a bunch of declines. There was, there was a 90% a decline in 2000 in Amazon, and yet the stock really winds up going. So as long as people can generate revenue growth, strong revenue growth over time, that company is going to still wind up being an attractive purchase when you get these big declines. 네, 미국 시카고에 있는 버니 씨와 이야기를 나눠봤습니다. 미국 주식 같은 경우는 서울경제TV 유튜브에서도 볼수 있고 저희 노란톡도 열어두고 있으니까요. 문자 샵 0082번으로 버니의 미국 주식 전송해 주시면 된다는 말씀 전해드리겠습니다.